This is Herschel Gordon Lewis. If you know who I am, God help you. If you don't know who I am, God help you. But what you're watching here or listening to is without your head. And I can tell you that I have contributed to the loss of your head. So thank you for being there. And welcome to the station of decapitation without your head. I am Nasty Neal. This is Annabelle Lecter. Mm -hmm. And we're joined by a prolific movie maker. He's made like over 40 movies or had a part in them. We have Mark Poloni on the line. How are you doing? Good, good. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. It's It's great to have have you. Yeah. And we want to let everyone know, now you've got a lot of movies out there, but right now Queen Crab is out from our uh, friends at Wild Eye Releasing. And for people who have it, who don't know, we've talked about on the show, but give it, can you give them an idea of what they're in for when they see Queen Crab? Well, Queen, Queen Crab is essentially a, a kind of a love letter to the 1950s and 60s stop motion uh, giant monster movies, uh, particularly Ray Harryhausen type films. Because, mm-hmm. um, you know, the crab is done with a mock-up model and, and stop motion. There's no CGI in this film at all. There is digital composition, but the crab itself is realized with the the process of stop motion animation. So, it's your typical tale of a um, scientist who's trying to end world hunger by making everything big, like vegetables and things like that. And his daughter, who they neglect, uh, finds this crab out by a pond, and she starts feeding it these grapes from this this tree that he's trying to grow and then obviously makes the crab grow so years later you know the parents are gone and and she is you know her best friend is this crab so um who gets into a lot of trouble and and you know chaos ensues so it's 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 a it's serious in one hand but but it doesn't take itself too seriously there's a lot of humor in it uh as well as action and your backwoods characters and things like that Mm -hmm. It really does cover all the bases. It is quite funny, and uh, but the acting isn't isn't totally crappy or anything like that. It's really good. I thought the characters were all quite enjoyable. Sometimes you get these movies, and even if they're people that are well known, you just don't like the characters that they portray. And I really I enjoyed everybody in this movie. Yeah, I mean, I you know, again, when you're when you're making a low budget movie, you, you, you know, there's a lot of things against you, so. And it's easy to throw darts at you know at a movie like Queen Crab because it, it didn't cost three million dollars. It cost a heck of a lot less. But you know you have to any movie you have to have likable characters in it. I mean I think that's a problem with some of the newer remakes of horror movies and things like that. You, you just don't like the people in it. You can't yeah. root for them. You don't feel sorry for them and. You fill a movie with unlikable people, it's hard to get behind that that kind of a a movie, a root for anybody. Yeah, that's so true. It seems like there's kind of like this uh, party of stereotypes that they just plug in movie after movie after movie, and they just find a face that fits it instead of bothering it. I mean, most of those stereotypes work in the movies. There's Mm -hmm. there's a reason they're there, but it's like... it's like, uh, there's just like a homogenization of it. It's mm-hmm. just dull. But you're, all yeah. the people in your movie, I mean, like, you, you know, there's roles that are normal in movies, but everybody you've got is really, is really pleasant, uh, pleasant to watch. Yeah, they, when they were all fun to work with, um, you know, and that's a key. A lot of, you know, people who don't make movies don't understand it, but the, what goes on behind the camera and on the set that energy and that fun gets transposed onto the screen and and i mean you can watch a movie like queen crab and you can go you know those guys probably had a good time making that movie you watch some other movies and you go that just doesn't seem like much fun you know that's a really good point really good that's from my perspective on making films Mm -hmm. you know yeah you have to you have to um, engage the people that you're working with. You have to, you know, instill ownership in it from everyone. Just because you're the producer or the director doesn't mean the guy holding the boom mic, you know, if he says, hey, why don't you do this? It's like, that's a great idea. You know, you, you, you make everyone feel <clears throat> like they're part of it. And, and 
you get a better production because they're not just being told what to do and, and, you know, they're doing it for very little. So, and, and, you know, the creative process lends itself to ideas. So someone may come up with an idea that's just like way off base and, you know, you just have to politely say, thanks, but that's not going to work because of this. But someone may say, Hey, why don't you have the crab throw the G? Yeah. Okay. That's a great idea. We'll, we'll, we'll see what we can do. And, and, it makes people feel a part of it, and then they enjoy the process more, and then they give you more. So everybody wins. Mm-hmm. How did you get involved with uh, Queen Crab? Well, uh, Queen Crab was an idea that well, Brett Piper is the director. I mean, I, I, he should get you know a shout out here. He he wrote it and uh, he directed it. I was the producer, and I play a small part at the beginning. I'm the 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 dad, the scientist mm-hmm. uh, father. Um, he and I have made a couple films together, but before that we met, uh, he did a movie called Drainiac and I, he needed someone to help him finish post-production and we connected and uh, I, you know, I finished it for him and we've been friends ever since I help him with stuff. He helps me with stuff. So we were just sitting around one day. We had made a film together called Muck Man, which was, uh, a pretty grueling experience. Then we did a movie called The Dark Sleep uh, that Fred Olin Ray released on his label. And then we did Queen Crab. We wanted to do a giant monster movie. And um, I can't, you know, we tossed around a whole bunch of ideas, something with a dinosaur and something with a giant ant, I think. But we decided to go with a crab because I don't, I think there's only been like one movie about solely about a giant crab that I can remember. It was made back in the seventies called Island Claws or something like that. Hmm. I could be wrong. There could be others, Hmm. but we decided to use a crab as our creature and that's really how it started. It's very likable little crab too. (laughs) I thought like, I don't get into a lot of monster movies, but uh, this crab had some personality. Yeah, he did. You know, it, it had, uh, you know, obviously, it you know was affectionate towards the, the the lead actress, but it also had its babies, and it was you know provoked to rage when you know they got shot and run over and killed. And there, you know, there's a tender little moment with the crab where it's poking one of the dead babies, and then it goes on a rampage. You said uh, Mockman was a grueling uh, a grueling film to make. Uh, how so? Well, Muckman, uh, there were some problems with some of the original talent that we hired, and at one point they left. Two of the lead actors had decided they were going to leave. Wow. And it just it threw the production into a tailspin. So it was supposed to be a three-weekend, a six-day shoot turned into, I mean, I think we were shooting like the weekend before Thanksgiving that year, and we finally got it wrapped, but... Yeah, when you're working with with little money, it doesn't take much to sabotage a picture, you know, because people are giving their time. You're spending your own personal money. Um, you know, it got made, but it just it it caused a lot of ripples. The, the, them leaving and having to replace them caused a lot of ripples that mm-hmm. kept pushing other people's schedules around, and it just. It, I've never had that problem on a film. I mean, I've, I've simply never had to deal with that because. You know, I've never had any anyone walk off any of my sets, so it was um, it was problematic, and it, you know, it, it dis- deflates morale, and you have to keep things going, and and it, it all turned out, but it just you know, it was somewhat unpleasant. Mm-hmm. Muckman is is a fun movie, though. It is. I mean, for for all the trouble we had making it, you wouldn't know watching it, but but uh, it. it um, it's an interesting picture. It's you know, people say you know, Mark, that's the only movie you've made where where everyone doesn't die. <laughs> I'm like, wow, you're right. I never I never noticed that, <laughs> or at least some. I don't think anybody dies in that movie. Uh, Kevin Van Zant is a uh, is in is in both uh, Muckman and um, and Queen Crab. Uh, uh, what, what's it about him that you like to have him in your films? Uh, Ken, Ken's a good friend of mine. I actually met him on a, um, I do production work on the side. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to lie and say I'm, I make a living, you know, off my films. That's simply not true. But, you know, I have a day job and Ken and I met somewhere and, uh, we were talking and believe it or not, 
Do you know who Larry Buchanan is? The name is very I'm familiar. not sure. He what would we know him like, from? He made movies that he made remakes of old AIP films that played on TV. He did the, the Eye Creatures and the Curse of the Swamp Creatures, Zontar thing from Venus. That's probably his most famous movie. But um, Ken was actually in one of his movies in the in the early '80s. And Ken said, "You know, I was in this movie. I, you probably don't even know what it is. It was about this." And I said, "I said, yeah, that that movie was called Down on Us, and it was directed by Larry Buchanan." And he's like. He's like, how the hell did you know that? I said, Cause I, you know, I don't only not only make movies, I have an interest in them. So we became fast friends, and and he's like, well, yeah, I'd like to get back into acting, and you know, that's all I needed to hear. So I think the first film he was in for us was Peter, no, Razor Teeth, and then Peter Rottentail. And then he's gotten bigger roles. That's time permit. So he's just an easy guy to work with, and he's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. I think for, uh, for fans of your movies too, it's fun to to see uh, you know familiar faces you know uh, pop up uh, throughout the films. Well, yeah, you know because it's like to do this efficiently, you have to have a team not only behind behind the camera but in front of the camera, and you use people you, that are good first of all that are good be that you can work with, you know, because you can't, there's nothing worse than someone with an attitude and, and see, uh, you know, the reliable, you know, here's our production schedule. Can you be here this day, this day, this day, and this day? And they, they can, and they will. And if you know, they wouldn't come back if they didn't like the experience because making a movie is a lot of fun, but it's a lot of hard work. For, for everybody, not just the director or the producer. It's work for everybody. So you have to you have to develop a rapport with them. Again, you have to keep them connected. You have to listen to them when they have something to say. And, you, you know, you have, you have to have a good time, but at the end of the day, you still have to get everything shot. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of work to, you know, to keep all that momentum going and they either like it or they don't, you know, they either get along with you or they don't, they either like your directing style or they don't, but people keep coming back. So we're, we must be doing something right. Mm -hmm. This might be a, a lot of question, but what is the role of a producer? Well, a producer, it's, it's a producer can be a lot of things. A producer could be someone who says, here's, Twenty thousand dollars to go make me a movie, or a producer could be someone who has the money but is also involved in hiring the talent, hiring the crew. They're on the set every day, making sure things are moving. They're on the set every day, making sure this is taken care of. Okay, you need this, you need that. I'll go get this. We have to move on. We're out of time. Let's go to this location. That location's set to go. Let's go. Time for lunch. Time for dinner. Uh, we have to work late. I'll be out here freezing in the zero degree weather with you. You know that kind of. That's the kind of producer I am. Yeah, that person is awesome. <laughs> so, and and then you know if you're doing that and directing and running camera, you've got your hands full all day. So yeah, that's a hell of a producer right there you just described. Yeah, I mean it's a lot of fun. Some producers they don't even show up on the set. They look at dailies and then make a phone call to someone say change this, change that. I, I like being on the set. Um, I mean, because I direct my own movies and edit them and shoot them, sometimes all three on a production, and am the producer. So, you know, uh, going through the ranks like I have, you learn every role, every responsibility, and you you know you try to do it all as best as you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, being off hands, uh, hands off seems really boring. I can only, I don't know. I've not been a producer, and I don't know loads of producers, but. I would definitely want to at least be around, and I can see the only reason someone wouldn't be is if they just wanted to make some money off of the movie and just yeah, toss yeah. money at it. Right. They, you know, they get here's here's X amount. I'm going to make X amount back. But a, a, I think a real producer um, should be there because they're the ones. They're ultimately the ones responsible. It used to be the director was the auteur of a film. I mean, they called the shots. Today, the producer is the one with the power. Um, the director can be replaced. Hmm. Um, you know, not that that's the attitude anyone should have, but you know, the roles have gotten reversed over the years. The directors used to 
in the old days of Hollywood, they had to say. Now directors, they you know, they don't have as much authority as they used to. The producer can come in and make a lot of changes. So it's a, a good producer hires a good director they can work with. Um, that way, there aren't there aren't conflicts from the get go because you know that that stuff should all be ironed out before you start rolling film or you know shooting because you know no one has time to listen to two people argue for forty five minutes about yeah. something stupid. Mm-hmm. Now you mentioned you know have uh, having all different roles on your different movies. Uh, which one's the most challenging for you? Um, I think you know. At my level, and I don't mean that in any negative sense, but when you're making a low-budget movie, the most challenging, I think, is is taking a script and breaking it down. It, let's say, okay, we have six days to shoot this. You have to break that down efficiently day by day based on who's there, your talent, your crew. Do we need special effects? How much time is this going to take? And... You, you you just have to keep, you know, you show up early and you're the last one to leave. And when you leave, everyone goes to bed except you. You're sitting up half the night planning for the next day to do it all over again. So mm-hmm. keeping up the energy level for six days straight when, when you're assuming and, you know, taking on a lot of different responsibilities is tough, especially when you get to like the fourth day. And you have to know, you have to be able to look at a script from beginning to end and know, okay, this is what it's going to take to put this production together. And then you disseminate it in days. And what I like to do is I front load my schedule. That that gives me some leeway in the back. Front load means the first three days of a six day shoot may be heavier than day four and five and day six may be lighter than five and four and five, just in case we need to catch up. Because if you back load your schedule, you're asking for trouble. We did a picture for Fred Elwin Ray called Amityville Death House, and, and it, it has limited locations, but I, I knew enough to look at it when, when we wrote the script, and I worked with someone on that, that the whole last half of the movie, the last 10 or 12 minutes, there's a lot going on in that. I mean, this lady turns into a spider, people turn into zombies, there's, there's just all kinds of stuff going on. I knew that was going to take an entire day to shoot nothing else could be scheduled for that now the day or two before that we had some outdoor stuff and it was literally 10 degrees below zero wow we we shot what we could and then we had to you know you have to be flexible and be able to go okay we have to change this we're going to move inside i mean it all worked out but you, you have to think on your feet because when you're shooting a movie at any level, there's no such thing as a problem, only a solution. Okay, this is not working. Here's what we have to do to, to make it work. You don't have time to sit around and, you know, figure it. You have to figure it out, but you don't have all the time in the world, so you have to be quick about things. And, and experience teaches you that. Uh, what was it like uh, work with Eric Roberts on that film? I never met Eric Roberts, to be quiet. I mean, I've met no him. No one but seems not... to meet Eric Roberts, from what we've no. heard. <laughs> no, no I, one I, meets I Eric met him, Roberts. I met him at a convention uh, outside of the production, but um, Fred Fred brought him in once I delivered the picture, and he, you know, he did all that stuff with him. So I, I never, I never worked with him, but I hear he's an okay guy. <laughs> from the few people who actually interacted with him. Yeah, yeah, he does a lot of work. He, <laughs> he, he does. does a lot of voiceover work. Um, he's another one of those guys that, that, that's you know in all kinds of stuff. I wished I would have met him. I just I didn't have the opportunity. So mm-hmm. yeah, he pops up in uh, everything lately. Human Centipede three and. Yeah, but it's almost universal that so few people get to interact with him. But he's so like you said, he's so busy. It's like he's just boom, 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 boom. Yeah, I don't, he's got yeah, the time I, I, to meet people. I didn't even know, you know. I, I Fred had talked to me, said, "Hey, what if I got Eric Roberts in this picture?" I'm like, "That'd be great." You know, we could we could use him for a day on the set. Oh no, 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 he'll be. We'll shoot that stuff here. I'm like, okay, I'm fine <laughs> with that too. <laughs> he probably wouldn't have had a real good time here because it was 
the, the six days we shot that movie, the warmest day we had was 10, uh, 10 degrees, 10. Wow. Where were yeah, you? We, we were filming, um, in, we're in Pennsylvania, but it just, we had this really cold spell. It, I mean, it worked for the movie because it has a, there's snow and it has that real rural, uh, feel to it, but it's, you know, it's just, you, you freeze. It was just cold. And the location we shot at was cold. And, wow. you know, it, there was a point where we were filming outside and in between takes when we'd have to reset lights, the actors would run inside and warm up and then they'd come back and then they'd go back in. They're like, why don't you come in and stand? I'm like, because if I go inside, I'm not coming back out. <laughs> I'm just going to stay here because I will not come back outside once <laughs> I go back in where there's heat. And, I mean, it was, it was a tough shoot. It was really tough. It was tough on everybody, but it, it uh, you know, they see you out there doing it and they don't mind. If I was in a trailer all warm and barking orders through a microphone, they probably would not have stayed outside as long as they did. Mm-hmm. They so, certainly wouldn't have given as as happy a performance anyways, I would imagine. No, no we would have had a revolt after day two, I think. Yeah. Now, uh, you, you mentioned being hands-on and everything. How hands-on are you for uh, the stop motion? Uh, Brett, I mean, I've toiled with stop motion, um, and I've done a little bit of my own for a film I just, uh, well, not just produced, directed and produced called Jurassic Prey. Um, but Brett handles a lot of that. He likes to work. He, he's really good at that. He works alone. Um, you know, we got him the equipment he needed to do what he needed to do, and, and he, he did the rest. I mean, he's a genius when it comes to that stuff. He has patience I don't have. I mean, I'm a patient guy, but I don't have those kind of patience. Yes, well, I was wondering how long it takes, because uh, I'm a huge fan of stop motion in films you know, ever since I was a little kid and still love it today. So uh, I assume it would ta- that has to take like a, a, a huge amount of time. It took months to do the special effects. Mm. From, I mean, because from, uh, the crab is in the whole movie. I mean, from when he's little till... The end when the jets are shooting at him. I mean, the crab's in it quite a bit. So I remember we shot that movie in August, and I think we were still working on it May the following, April the following year. I mean, it just it takes a long time to do that stuff. Mm-hmm. I don't want to spoil it because I do think it's funny to just see on your own, but I, I'll just say I really like it when the little girl is holding the crab. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see that now that was, that was, that was the stop motion model, but Brett went in and and moved the legs. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a couple scenes where, you know, it's being fed, but then she picks it up and, you know, we had, we had to figure out how we were going to do this. Cause the last thing, you, know, you don't want it to look dead when she's holding it and then you put it down and it's running all over. So he's like, well, I'll move, I'll make the legs move a little. Like, you know, when you pick up a crab, it'll mm-hmm. twitch. And I'm like, how are you going to do that? I mean, she's holding it. We don't have a lockdown plate. He's like, I'll figure it out. And, and he <laughs> did. I mean, it looks like it's move. It looks like a real crab or at least a prop that has movable legs on it. Mm-hmm. Now, um, are you are you a fan of of stop motion? It, you know, in movies. Oh, absolutely! Yeah, yeah. My favorite Ray Harryhausen movie is Valley of Guanji. Hmm. I don't know if I've seen that. That's uh It's like a western. Um, it, it's it's got a duck, like an allosaur. It takes place in Mexico in the tur- at the turn of the century. Um, and of course, Mysterious Island, which I think is probably his best film. Yeah, I'm always a big fan of, the, of course, the skeleton scene in Jason the Ark. Oh, yeah, that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. One person, four months. It, it takes 20 people a year to do that today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, what movies in general, you know, uh, did you watch as a kid that made you want to become a, a movie maker? Oh, I mean, I, and people ask me that all the time, and oddly enough, I can I I know the exact moment when I thought this is you know this is what I want to do. I was five years old, and I think it was a rainy Saturday, and uh, you know you're flipping the channel. Back then, it would have been 70, 1973, somewhere in there, and um, Godzilla versus the Thing was on TV. It's called Godzilla versus Mothra now, but. 
I mean, I just remember watching that movie and being just fascinated with, you know, he comes up out of the dirt and now he's fighting this moth and these two caterpillars show up. And I, I mean, it's something about that at that moment. I, you know, I didn't know how they did it or what it was. And I just thought, this is what I want to do. Mm. And from that moment on, um, you know, I watched all those kinds of movies and there were, there were, there were a few books out there that talked about it, but uh, you know, it was a lifelong process. You, you know, I started writing scripts and then, you know, okay, well, now we can film this because there wasn't video. Then you had to use eight millimeter or super eight. Oh, we can edit this now. Oh, now we can add sound to this. Oh, we can shoot outside at night. Uh, you know, now we can do special effects. It's just, it was years of, of, um, immersing myself in it um from from that early of an age really i mean it sounds crazy but it's true um five years old you know the 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 seed of that was planted and when i was 11 i shot my first super eight movie um you know and from there it's uphill or downhill depending on how you look at it (laughs) do you still have that film yes absolutely I still have the camera I shot it with. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, is that like in a special place? No, it's in my basement. I mean, it <laughs> probably should, should be somewhere, but it's downstairs in, in the basement oh. in, the, in a case somewhere. Yeah, yeah you've got it. Yeah. It's like everybody that has their, their cool old stuff. It's not necessarily oh, yeah, like it's, on your mantle for the world. No, it's, it's, but it's, you know, it's significant <laughs> to what what you do, you know. I, yeah. I I work at a university, and I meet a lot of kids who they come to school and they think, well, I think this is what I want to do. And I'm like, you know, I was a decade and a half ahead of them because I knew from an early age what I wanted to do, and I and never never took my eyes off that. Wow. So it, it's I mean, I, and I'm not I'm not a super successful filmmaker. Um, so, but you're making you know, you things just, that you really enjoy. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm not a millionaire, but but I'm doing what I want, and 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 have had a small amount of success doing it. But I always tell people that it it doesn't come without a lot of hardship, a lot of pain, a lot of learning. Uh, you know, I think the best directors in the world are probably the ones that gave up and never finished the race. So that's how I look at it. I'm running a race and my, you know, I probably won't stop doing this until I'm dead. That's really the truth of the matter. Um, now, however long that is and however far I get, we'll see, but, uh, it's been fun so far. Now, you know, when you started, I know you you guys had your first uh, movie like out like when you were like nineteen, and so, seventeen. Seventeen. Wow. And so you you know you were around for the like the boom of the VHS, and then mm-hmm. you know transition to DVDs, and now there's really no video stores. Uh, what's that change been like for you as a movie maker? Well, you you know change is change. You 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 just have to adapt. Um, we were fortunate that. We did get in at the at the at the video boom. If we'd have been born two decades earlier, we probably would have done much better because we would have been in a better position to exploit that new medium. But um, you know, it, it it it's it hasn't been terribly difficult because my my mindset is that the medium doesn't matter. The fact is, you're making a movie, and there's always going to be a way for people to see it. Mm-hmm. Um, whether they re- put it in a ca- it's on a cassette and they put it in a machine, whether it's on a DVD, whether they can download it and stream it, which is where all this stuff is headed. It doesn't matter to me wh- how people see it. Uh, it makes it tougher because the the market, you know, like the VHS market was huge. They'd take anything, and then it got small. Then DVD came out, and and the the um, the what am I trying to say? But you, you getting your movie out there was a little bit tougher, and now that DVD's gone and there's Blu-ray, it, you know it, it shrinks. Your opportunities get a little smaller. The marketplace gets a little smaller because it's controlled by bigger companies, and you you know you keep getting squeezed out. Mm-hmm. Um, streaming certainly 
is is a platform that I think will open the doors. But you know, the bottom line is you just still have to make things people want to see. Um, mm. So it's it's a double edged sword. I think you have to be able to adapt. You have to be able to realize that things change, and you you've got to move with it in some degree, or you you will be left behind. Mm. However, you. Uh... Define success. What has been for you your most successful film? Well, whether that's financially or your personal experience. Yeah, you know, I, I guess you know before you define, I, I I get that question a lot, especially from younger people, and I I always say before you can define success, you need to define what fail. What is failure? Failure is another opportunity for you to try again. Success to me. It's not based on money. It's not based on how many movies you've made or sold. It's based on your ability to overcome the odds that are stacked against you to do what you want to do. That is success. And that That's how I measure it. Now, based on films, I would probably say I think the best movie I've made was probably Amityville Death House. Mm-hmm. I think our most successful movie was Feeders which back in the day, I think we ended up selling seven and a half thousand units of that film. Hmm. So, you know, that, that movie got out there and a lot of people saw it, but to me, that, that that's a different kind of success. Um, yeah. I, I guess I look at it a little differently. I think anytime, any anytime you make a movie, finish it, and people get to watch it, that is a success because it's it's such a tough, tough, tough business at 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 our level, and it's it's even tougher when you know your everything works against you, and you have to maneuver through that to get a movie done and and get it done right and and get it out there for people to see it. And we've managed to do that. I've, I've made 45 films, and most of them at one point or another were readily available. Mm-hmm. Um, one, one or two played on cable. Um, they, you know, they, they were sold overseas or dubbed in different languages. You know, and that's, that's kind of cool. Yeah, that's um, why I asked uh, kind of open, open-ended, but uh, your response is great. So what for a f- for one of your films kind of to match what your personal definition of success w- is what's a movie that you had the biggest struggles with but then ended up turning that into what you consider success Um boy you know I think Feeders was probably Feeders was a movie that 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 um we shot it was originally called Invasion and we we filmed it and then we did a rough cut and it just I don't know. It needed work. And we moved on to something else. And my wife said, you really ought to finish this movie and, you know, put better special effects in it. And, and she was right. I, I did a re-edit. I found a guy to do effects and Independence Day had just come out. We had sent a screener to Blockbuster and I was at work and this guy called me. He said, this is so-and-so from Blockbuster. We want to take, we want to release your movie. I'm, and I didn't believe him, you know, cause I dealt with some pretty low life people in my time. And, mm-hmm. and, um, you know, you, you, you don't believe people at face value at first. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, um, yeah, I'll think about it because I, I thought I didn't know who this guy was. And, you know, he hung up, and two days later, he calls again. He says, look, we want your, your movie. And, and I said, okay, why do you want it? Explain <laughs> to me why, why you want this movie. Because, you know, you know, yeah, it's low budget, but it's got a great box. And, you know, Independence Day just came out. He said, everybody, it was a board. Everybody on the board liked it. They want to, they want to pick it up. The president of the company has to watch it and i think he took it on vacation with him and they ordered four and a half thousand copies um and it rented so well uh, you know not without some complaints obviously but it rented so well they ordered another three three thousand um and it, it was their number one independent film rental of 1996 and i said wow. what does that mean i said what does that mean it out rented movies that cost two million dollars wow that's incredible 
I said, that's really interesting. I, they said, yeah, the movie was profitable for Blockbuster Video. Um, and, and I think it was the first movie where, where people say, who are these guys, you know? You know, and if you watch it, it, it it's it, it's not a perfect movie. It, it costs very little, but, you know, I don't even want to say how little it costs because, <laughs> you know, there'll be hate mail in my inbox tomorrow from people listening to this, but it, it was a huge success, a huge success. A movie that cost what that did should not have, you know, <laughs> would not have gotten that far. It's again, right time, right place, right product. Um, sometimes that's what, that's how success happens. Mm-hmm. You um, mentioned- I'm, yeah, and I'm not going to, I can take partial credit for it, but not all the credit for it. You mentioned um, having a great box. You know, how important was that, you know, especially when Blockbuster around and, and during the VHS days? Because I know, I remember myself going into uh, into the video stores and renting a lot of the movies that I hadn't heard of solely based on the on the box. Right. Well, again, I mean, you could put anything on a box, but once people got home, they, you mm-hmm. know, they either realized that they were they've been had or okay, this movie's <laughs> sort of like it. So our, our thing was the, the box should reflect the movie. And, and we, you know, we wanted the earth with the alien head coming up and then we came up with the tagline earth was just an appetizer, which I still think is pretty clever. <laughs> um, and you know, the key, the thing is, is that when you design a box is that once you get someone to pick it up off the shelf, it's 80% rented, 80% rented. Cause I would walk past movies. I don't, you know, I wouldn't even pick it up, but if you get them to pick it up, they'll come back to that and rent it usually nine out of 10 times. So the key was to always come up with something striking it or something on it that they would want to pick it up and go, what, what the heck is this? Thing? <laughs> um, and it, it did well. Um, we did two movies. We did house that screened and the sequel, those were those were uh, big rent rentals. Um, we did a movie called Among Us, which aired on it. It, it was on DVD by then. VHS was gone, but it it was uh, picked up by the Canadian Sci-Fi Channel, not the one in the United States, the Canadian Sci-Fi Channel. And we we licensed that to them for like three years. They could show it, and uh, they did. I actually I. You know, it's weird watching your movie, and then all of a sudden they go to a commercial break for Stargate, Atlantis, and <laughs> Predator. It's like, really? <laughs> it's yeah. almost surreal. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. How? But it's... Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. Well, um, it must be really weird. I know you were talking earlier about um, how when they originally got in touch with you, that you were not believing them. Does that come from, is that, I can't assume that's just a natural way of being like, Oh, this person's interested in me. They, there's no way that's possible. They, there's gotta be something going on here. So how has that process been from becoming, I would assume someone that's like, Oh yeah, absolutely. To someone that's more shrewd. Well, you, you, yeah. I mean, cause you know, when you're young, you, you just look at the stars and, and you just, you know, by that point in our career, we, we'd had some run-ins with people of less than, less than stellar uh, reputations and whatnot. But, you know, you just learn. It's like, okay, this sounds too good to be true. Cause you know, the old adage is if it sounds too good to be true, it usually is too good to be true. So, you know, I would have called this guy back, but I wasn't in a hurry. I was probably baiting him to see if he was serious, but they were serious. Cause again, they called back and then I, you know, then I, we talked and I did some checking and, and, uh, it was kosher, but you know, you get all kinds of calls and, and emails from people who claim they're this, that and everything else. And they really aren't. So you just have to learn to be dis- discerning, discreet, um, and, and, and follow through when someone, says, hey, I got a deal for you, you know, okay, what is it? Let's talk about it. I don't like this part of the deal. I mean, I made a movie called Halloween Night, and um, this company whose name I won't mention, that's still in business, called me and said, yeah, we want your movie. We're going to retitle it to something else because they had, 
it was a scarecrow movie and and I said okay well send me the send me a deal you know what do you what are you offering and they they sent me this deal and it's like you know by the time it was done I would have owed them eighty thousand dollars <laughs> and and wow. you know they they called back and they're like well what did you think of the deal um um are you gonna are you gonna sign with us I said no I'm not gonna sign with you this isn't <laughs> a deal this is robbery <laughs> I'm not doing this and and you know they try to convince you that oh well don't worry it's gonna make money blah 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 yeah it'll make money for you I'll never see any of it and so I just said you know what no I'm not interested in this you know but. 15 or 20 years ago, I may have jumped on it because I saw it as an opportunity. Um, you know, at that point in my career, I didn't need that kind of an opportunity. So, you know, you learn to just look at it at face value and say, nope, that's not for me. No, um, what's it been like uh, working with uh, Wild Eye Releasing? Um, I, you know, I've had a really good experience with them, Rob. Um, you know, we... I think I reached out to him on another title and, you know, we started talking. I don't think he re- ended up releasing it, but it got the ball rolling. And, you know, they, they're, you know, they got the movie and family video They're You know, he, the guy works really hard. I mean, he's probably one of the last true independents, at least at this level. Um, I think he does an honest job of what he's doing. I think he cares about the product and he's a fan of it, which helps, you know, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I've had nothing but good experiences with him, and we're actually working on some co-productions, so that's that's going to be interesting. Oh, nice. Uh, from from our dealings with him, they've been great, and uh, they also seem to have a lot of fun with the packaging and, and different like uh, ideas they have. You know, they put out like uh, kind of they put out retro VHS copies of some of their, mm-hmm. their titles. Mm-hmm. And they put out like well, yeah, and their, their, their artwork is fantastic. Yeah. And now when I looked at the Queen Crab one, I said. You know what? Everything on this box is in the movie. A giant crab, people shooting at it, a jet, and explosions. I said, <laughs> it's not a lie. This, this poster is not a lie. Uh-huh. I have to say, when we were doing another interview and uh, found out about Wild Eye, your, yours is the one that caught my, Before I knew anything about it, before I knew anything about you, it totally caught my eye, and I found it like, Neil, you have to watch this trailer. <laughs> this is amazing and lo and behold yeah. it was amazing <laughs> it's awesome well, they did uh they were i did a movie called meat eaters which which um i had licensed initially to full moon as part of their wizard video thing but that didn't go anywhere so i got got it back and we worked out a deal at wild eye and and he wanted to retitle it to jurassic prey or something with jurassic obviously because mm-hmm. jurassic world came out Nonetheless, that movie did much better than mine, but that's a whole nother story. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, the the artwork, he sent me the artwork, and I looked at it, and I thought, this is fantastic. I mean, and again, it's not a complete lie. There's a giant dinosaur, there's people shooting at it, and there's an, expl- an explosion. I mean, all that stuff is in the movie. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so someone can't rent it and go, what, this isn't in the movie, what a <laughs> sham, because uh, it is, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that, I think they they have a great artist. They have a great artist. Yeah, and that stuff is important because you know just that I see that just myself and like oh I want to see this just based off the artwork. Well, movie posters today are so boring. Mm-hmm. I mean, look at look at a movie poster from the seventies like Food of the Gods or Land That Time Forgot. You you know they're not great movies, but you look at the poster and you go, man, it makes you want to see it. I look at movie posters today, and I don't even know what the movie's about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like like okay, let's take for example, John Carter, the the movie that was based on on um, the Edgar Rice Burroughs books. Mm -hmm. First of all, it should be John Carter of Mars. Mm -hmm. When you see Mm -hmm. when you hear John Carter, what is it about? Is it about a lawyer? (laughs) What what is this movie about? (laughs) For the lay person, they would have no idea what that movie is. The poster didn't help sell it either. So, you know, how can you take something so fantastic and extravagant of an idea and just put one person's face on? Mm-hmm. The, the whole art form of, of marketing has really gone in a direction that it's just not fun, you know. It really isn't that fun. And that was what was cool about movies from the 70s. You know, you knew you weren't going to get half of what you saw, but that was kind of the fun part of it. 
now you get more, but the posters are so boring, you don't even know what you're going in to see. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, honestly, now I think of all the ones that stick out in my mind are definitely from like the seventies and eighties, and uh, there's hardly any modern posters that that I have any uh, recollection of. Yeah, yeah, because there's nothing exciting. The post again, it you know the movies were trying. The poster sold the movie because you didn't have you, you weren't twentieth century Fox who could who could plaster. You know, they already have a built-in market. They don't need to go to the extra limit to, to do this. These these other companies, they, like AIP, they were operating under a whole different set of, of guidelines, and the way they shipped their movies and played them in different areas was a lot of work. So they had to have something that caught people's attention. Nowadays, it's so easy. The, the, the studios own the movie theaters, so what difference does it make how lousy yeah. the poster is? You're going to sit there yeah. and watch their stuff anyway. I do have to mention my favorite poster, which I've mentioned many times on the show, is uh, from the original Maniac. I think that for horror posters, that's just an amazing, uh, that's amazing that's cover. A good, that's a good one. I'd have to say mine is Food of the Gods, with the rat in the tree and the girl uh-huh. hanging off the land. I mean, it's not in the movie, but what a poster. <laughs> what a poster. <laughs> yeah. I always really love uh, the Creep Show uh, poster, too, with the uh, that's skeleton. Good. That one's the awful. Mm. Yeah, and I, you know, and I think that's the reason why a lot of people uh, uh, collect those and have them on shirts. And I don't know if people are really going to be collecting any posters from the last few years. I yeah, I don't think so because you know they wouldn't even know what they're looking at. <laughs> they just wouldn't. Mm-hmm. So, uh, what's the reaction been like for uh, Queen Crab? Uh, well, it's, it, it, it's really too early to tell. It just came out. But, mm-hmm. uh, I mean, it's it's probably gotten the most positive reviews of any film I've been involved with. It's I really mean, enjoyable. Of course, you have, you have people that don't like... You know, again, people are, have a right to their opinion. They don't have to like anything. But overall, I think it's... It's been fairly positive. You get, you know, you get the reviews that say it's got bad acting. It looks cheap. It it's, uh, doesn't compare to oh, today's blockbusters. And, and you know what? They're, they're, they're <laughs> wrong in some respects. But, but it's again, that's silly. You're not a blockbuster company. So why? It's that's to me, that's crazy. Like I, I will hold a Hollywood standard kind of production value to someone that has that much money to invest. You right. are taking what you have and doing as much as you can with it. I think that should be appreciated. Right. No, you're right. You're right. But the problem is, is people don't understand that because they think any movie that gets released costs millions of dollars. They're not yeah. aware of this this grassroots movement and things like that. And you know, you can't fault them for it. But but um, yeah, it's it's movies today cost so much money. You know. Two hundred million dollars to spend on a movie. I can't even imagine having that luxury. I really can't. Um, I don't think movies should cost that much money, but they do um, for whatever reason. Uh, um, it'd be fun. people always say, "Mark, would you direct a huge, big budget movie?" And I usually say, "Yeah, I'd like to do it once, just to see what it's like." And then and then go back to making little films, but but you know making a low budget movie is tough. Making a big budget movie like you know in the hundred fifty two hundred million dollar range can't be as much fun as what we do. If you had don't... someone originally come to you with any one of the movies you've already made with like this giant budget and said, "I'm going to give you this money to make this movie," which one would you pick and why? Which one would I pick? That's a good question. Um, I would have to say I would remake Feeders. I, I think that the movie has so much... If it had more money, it has so much potential. And I wouldn't even change the poster. <laughs> I, I think it's just it's it's a fun movie. I think there's so much that, that could be done with it. Um, but, you know, anything you've made, you could throw more money at and make it better to some degree but um you know that's that's a good question people always ask me too if you could remake any horror movie what would it be and you know they expect friday the 13th or jaws and i think 
if if someone said you can remake any horror movie you want, I would remake a movie called Horror Express. I love seen? that movie. <laughs> That's one of my favorite movies. That movie, I, yeah, my son and I just watched it. I mean, I've seen it dozens of times, but mm. that movie has everything in it anyone would ever want to watch. And it never stops. And it, it's just really a well-done, interesting, uh, creepy at times movie. And it has a great music score. And it's just like I'm watching this going, if you release this movie today the way it is, people would pay to go see it. It's just such a good movie. It's, it's a really good movie. It really does have everything. It's got the cast, the set. I mean, the just the feel to the movie. It's uh, it's like a mystery and a horror, and there's a lot of things you have to pay attention to. Yeah, and I, but I even if you just sat it, yeah. there, with no, if you were like 10 and you watched that movie, you'd be entertained. I, I saw it as a kid, and I remember it, it, yeah. it was just like, you know, you didn't take your eyes off it. I mean, it starts out like there's a big foot on, you know, and then it turns out he's an alien that hops around people, and then there's zombies at the end, and, you know, there's they send this train on this dead-end run, and they're trying to unhook the... It's just, it's just like, it's nonstop. I mean, and that movie probably cost nothing. You, you know, you know, probably three, four hundred thousand is the most that movie cost which even at the time wasn't a lot of money. But it just really, really, anyone, I, I would encourage anyone to seek that movie out and watch it who's never seen it before. So you mentioned uh, Feeders a few times. Uh, what, what, what's Feeders 2? What, what's going on? I know it's a Christmas movie. A few years too. Uh, uh, see, our our idea was to have uh, every, every year we were going to make a, a different feeders movie, and we were going to keep the same poster but put a different hat on the alien. <laughs> and because feeders too, you know, again, this is a marketing standpoint. Feeders too is about Christmas. It's really uh, kind of our version of Santa Claus conquers the Martians. <laughs> and, and on the poster, it's identical to the original, except the feeder has a Santa hat on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then we were going to do one out in the old west, and they, you know, the feeder would have a cowboy hat, and and uh, we had all these crazy ideas, um, you know, to keep the thing going. But but uh, I remember when we were going to make feeders to John McBride, uh, who was in the original and was in the sequel. He's like, you're not really going to make this, are you? That this movie is just not going to work. This is just no way. This is a this is a really bad idea. You shouldn't do it. And I'm like, no, John, don't worry. It's the way we're going to handle it right. And when it was all done, it's like one of his favorite movies that we've done. He's like, <laughs> I don't, this movie really works. This should be like a Christmas movie that every year is on TBS. I'm like, well, I wish it was, John, but it just didn't happen. <laughs> But, you know, it's, it's, you try to have fun with this stuff. Mm. So uh, what happened with the idea of uh, of doing uh, uh, feeders every year? Well, this, you know, the sequel was it was really not that well uh, released and received. By then, Blockbuster had stopped uh, stocking independent movies on their shelves um, mm. because the majors started forcing them to give them more space so that meant they had less money to you know they had to buy more copies of their movie at excessive prices and didn't have they, they just didn't want to spend the money on little movies anymore so by the time that by the time feeders two rolled around they were they weren't they weren't interested which i thought was shocking but um people who have seen it seem to like it probably more so than the original because it is it's a, it's a christmas movie and it has santa claus and it. it's just really really ridiculous but funny at the same time yeah now, well, we're uh here at without your head we're big fans of uh christmas horror films so uh, yes this is definitely yes, one we indeed. need to seek out we like well, holiday films really yeah uh but speaking but we're of that, gonna have to find that for exactly. sure speaking of that what's uh, the best way to uh to find your films uh, the best way to find our films is probably to just go on the internet and, you know, you can find, if you have a family video near you, you can find a couple of our movies. They're in FYE. Um, there's, there's several, uh, Roku channels that have them. There's several, uh, video on demand channels that have them. Um, 
companies like Camp Motion Pictures, uh, Sub Rosa Studios, and then just people in general who buy them and want to sell them on eBay and things like that. Uh, what's a, what's a, what what can we look forward to uh, the future? Well, I you know I like I said we we produced or Brett and I uh, finished a movie called Triclops. I like and that already. We're already working on another picture, like a kind of a. Uh, I like to call it our homage to Italian post-apocalyptic movies, but he would disagree. <laughs> uh, let's see, <sighs> boy, I have another movie coming out through Wild Eye that I can't, I can't really mention at this point because it's it mm. hasn't been announced yet. Okay. But that should be pretty interesting. I'm producing another one for them right now that uh, jumps on the shark craze. That's all I can tell you about that. <laughs> um, boy, beyond that, um, that's probably it's probably as far out as I can see right now. That's a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, you know that, and and a day job. I'm pretty busy. <laughs> I, I wish there was sixty hours in a day instead of twenty four. Yeah. I wish I just didn't have to sleep. If I didn't have to sleep, uh, yeah, I'd get so much big. more done. <laughs> yeah, I'd have a hundred and fifty movies made instead of fifty. So, <laughs> so uh, how's Shocktober been going? Uh, I was reading about this. Uh, Shocktober went really well. Um, we, you know, we're screening some of our handpicked movies that I, that I picked out in uh, a local movie theater, and we've had. You know, attendance anywhere from, you know, 50 to 75, depending on the title. Um, it's interesting watching your movie on a big screen with, with people who don't really know you and know anything about what you do. It, it's really cool to, to watch your movie on a big screen. It, you really, it changes how you look at things. Um, Queen Crab looked great on a big screen. Mm -hmm. I mean, if that movie was in black and white and, and you know, we went back in time 50 years, it would have been equivalent to what was being made at the time. Mm -hmm. But it's a different experience when you watch something on a TV in your own house, but it's a whole different experience when you're in a big theater, you know, with a with 100 people and the screen's 20 feet wide and it really, you know... That's really when you see where you did right and where you did wrong because it's it's so large and it, it really draws you into the movie in a way that watching it at home doesn't. Yeah, that's something Annabelle and I talk about a lot, not necessarily from your perspective, but it's so much different to watch a movie at the theater as opposed to watching it on your computer screen, your TV. And mm -hmm. uh, we're lucky to have some uh, theaters around that show a lot of older movies and independent films and... Uh, Oh, we, we, yeah. I mean, last summer, my son and I went to two, count them, two all night oh, nice. car driving, uh, a drive. -in. He'd never been to a drive in mm -hmm. before. Cause, well. You know, by the time he was born, th they were starting to disappear. And we went in, in July, in June and then July to two separate ones. And it was, it was just cool watching these old retro movies, you know, like Death Dream and Don't Look in the Basement and House by the Lake and Food of the Gods. And it was just a uh, burial ground of all things. Um, you know, it's just. It's Did you just say burial experience. ground? Yes, they showed oh, that man. movie. I can't believe that, they would show that movie. <laughs> I did, like that they, movie, but it's a strange film. It is, and when that when the kid bites off his mother's boob, everyone was yeah. honking their horns. And <laughs> yeah, it was, just, it was wild. <laughs> um, it was just wild. But my son, I mean, he got to experience something most people will never know, and and it was just a lot. It was a lot of fun. I, I the best driving experience I ever had was one summer I saw Friday the Thirteenth Part Two, My Bloody Valentine, on the same show. Oh, nice. Yeah, you can't beat that. Mm -hmm. I always thought that's yeah. one of the most underrated uh, slasher films is My Bloody Valentine. It's a great movie. Mm -hmm. 
It is, yeah. We've uh, cheap plug for, for us. There's been of uh, I think uh, three uh, different interviews on the website with uh, with the director and cast members of My Bloody Valentine. Oh, yeah. Right, um, oh wow! Are they going to make a sequel? A sequel to that? Well, they remade, they remade it. it. I yeah. know that, but yeah, I think he's always one. They, they their plan was, but it's I don't think it's ever going to happen. I mean, the sequel I thought for sequels goes was was actually not bad. Um, but there's yeah, there's something about the original. It's just it's it, I mean it's miles and leagues above Friday the Thirteenth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, it costs less than than the sequel, but still, it's it's one of my favorite um, slasher movies. And then it came out with all the uh, missing footage, yeah. which really makes a huge difference. Mm-hmm. It was uh, when I interviewed the director. Um, name skips you right now. I'm about names, but um, I had mentioned him about the remake because at the time they were just doing it. And he didn't even know about it, which was really strange to break the news to the director of the original movie that they were remaking his film. Yeah, see, that's odd. But, you know, the way those deals go is um, that movie was shot in Canada, and it was probably Mm -hmm. shot, oddly enough, the government funded a lot of those movies, um, and they used them Mm -hmm. for tax shelters. So he probably, you know, when he made that movie, realized that he was never going to have any claim to it, and... I think the original producer was involved with the remake because um, he worked with David Cronenberg on a couple things. But that movie did well, and I think the people that made the remake went back to Lionsgate and said, why don't we do a sequel? And they said, no, we're not interested. Mm-hmm. That's we're really not st- interested in making money. Okay. <laughs> that was shot in Pennsylvania, by the way. Ah, that's always weird when they uh, reboot the, you know, they call them reboots, remakes, whatever. And um, a lot of them do well, then they then they never follow up and do another one. It's then well, like, like a few the years remake later, of Friday the 13th. I mean, I thought that was, other than Jason living underground, I thought that movie, the remake, was pretty decent. Mm-hmm. I mean, all things considered. And it I, did I'm really well. I'm shocked they haven't made a sequel yet. Yeah, and it did really well, and all the talks are that they're remaking it again instead of, you know, doing a sequel or, you know, just remake the whole movie again. Well, the, the remake was part, you know, greatest hits of part one through four. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that that was probably my only complaint is like, uh, like on the opening, just the opening credits is basically all of part one. Yeah, yeah. And then you have. Yeah, I was, I was watching. Going, okay, part two. Okay, part three. Oh, part four. Part two. Part, you know, they just pick everything from. You know, parts parts one through four are probably the best of the series. Minus I, I agree. six. Mm-hmm. I, I think six is my favorite. Um, I like the original four, but uh, he looks cool in six. Yeah, and and part three and three D. That was that's the best three D I've ever seen in my life. It was good. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, the best 3D I've ever seen. You uh, probably did. You never got to see it in 3D, did you? Yeah, I see. I saw it through. I actually I have the not. DVD too that they re-released in uh, in 3D with the 3D glasses. Yeah, I mean it was just but, uh, it was great. But you I know, see, Jason's crushing someone's head and their eyeball pops out. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> What's always fun about those movies, if you watch them, not in 3D, and there's just all these like for no reason, they'll just be sticking stuff in the camera. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they're they're they're, you know, they're trying to sell the gimmick. But oddly enough, the the what I think is the best 3D movie ever made is is uh, House of Wax with Vincent Price. Mm. And and um, the, the funny thing about that is is that the director only had one eye. He could not see 3D. Wow. They had to tell him, okay, here's what happens in 3D. And he's like, okay, I got it. And he designed the sets in what he thought would be good 3D, and and the 3D was really good because it wasn't always stuff coming out at the camera. He used he was the first director to use 3D in depth because mm-hmm. he simply didn't get it. I mean, he couldn't see it, he didn't understand it. So his idea was, okay, 3D is depth, but then you have the you know people hitting a ping pong balls and it's coming out at the camera and you know all that other stuff. But really, just the probably the best 3D movie ever made was House of Wax. I know uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon was done in 3D, and recently it's been uh, 
screening at theaters. So I say recently, been the last like five years at theaters in in 3D again. But I've never seen it in 3D. No, and again, that was done with the uh, the um, a different type of 3D. The uh, where you had to wear the red and uh, the gr- blue and magenta uh, glasses. Now the 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 3D that Friday the 13th was shot and was the same one that Andy Warhol used to shoot Frankenstein and Dracula. Hmm. Believe it or not, those movies were shot in 3D, hmm. and um, they used the same they used the same camera, I think, the same lens and system, which was. I mean, you needed a boatload of light to get an image. So that's why if you look at Friday the 13th Part 3, it's so overlit even at night because otherwise they couldn't get an image. It's, uh, it was pretty interesting, you know, pretty interesting how that movie was made. Probably more work went into that movie than the rest of the series. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, you mentioned, you know, uh, Godzilla vs. Mothra as being like the mm-hmm. movie that, that you remember and uh, that one you make uh, movies. Uh, but what are your favorite uh, horror films? Um, you know, I like lots of stuff. I like the, uh, you know, the Roger Corman, Edgar Allan Poe movies. Yeah. Uh, you know, I like the old Universal movies. I like, you know, European zombie movies, shallow films, uh, you know, contemporary stuff. Because I was, exp- I, I think I was born at the right time because cable it was burgeoning and I was exposed to all this different stuff that probably at the time I didn't, you know, when I saw horror express, I didn't know that movie was made in Spain. Mm. Um, you know, I didn't know Godzilla was made in Japan. I just, you know, so you have all these influences, hammer movies. I saw a lot of those, uh, you know, color movies, black and white movies, silent movies. There's just a, a a whole gamut of stuff. And then when the VHS market hit, that's when you really, you know, that's when things really get into the weird zone because everything was really stuff you'd never even heard of was coming out. So I was exposed to a lot, a lot of things. So for me, I really don't have a specific, um, genre. Like I can't mm-hmm. say I love Japanese science fiction movies above this. I, I really mm-hmm. took it all in and it's all, you know, it's all ingrained in me and all, it's, it's a part of me. So I, I don't, I, I can honestly say I'm not a real fan of some of the more modern stuff. Um, I don't know what, maybe I'm just out of touch with what they're trying to do. I'm I'm not sure, but I just don't, it doesn't really click with me. Um, uh, what do you mean by that, by the modern, like uh, the modern, like ghost movies or kind of the, uh, the, the, Quote, unquote, yeah, like the, like you know, like the um, paranormal activity. Yeah. Um, I'm always surprised they know. keep coming out because uh, I, I watched the first one and never wanted to see any more of them. But like, well, yeah, I watched the, the first one and I looked over at, at my son. I said, "We made this movie 20 years ago." <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I mean, kudos to the people that made it. I mean, good for them. I'm happy that you know they took a movie that cost so little and it made so much money. But I just didn't get into it. I'm, I just, I'm sorry, I didn't get into it. Um, mm-hmm. But it's a different generation, you know. It has that the the concept. I think you know the YouTube, the reality thing. It's just smart. The, the, that movie was 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 marketed very wisely and and. Um, you gotta give you gotta give those people credit, uh, even though I didn't like it. I, I I give I tip my hat to them because that's a success story, just like Blair Witch. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I hated that movie. I'm sorry. I, I I I couldn't even sit through it. But but good for them, you know. Good for them that they took something so simple and did so well with it. You know, we can all all of us can only be that lucky. But again, I just I didn't see the hype. I I didn't get into it. Um, they remade Poltergeist. Why? Why would you even think of doing something like that? You know, it was not bad, I didn't, honestly. <laughs> I didn't even. I didn't even. It might, it might have been good. I just simply didn't want to go see it. I just. I'm. I just didn't want to go see it. So, maybe I'm old fashioned. Maybe that's my problem. But I have Netflix, so I do watch stuff I normally wouldn't pay to go see. <laughs> you mentioned uh, going to movies with with your son. How old's your son? Oh, he's 21 now. Oh, all right. But how yeah, old was I mean, he when he started seeing uh, those kind of movies? Oh, well, he was a lot younger than my wife would have allowed him to go <laughs> see. So, 
that's a constant battle. Uh-huh. He was probably, I mean, there's things I wouldn't let him see. I mean, when I was younger, I got to see stuff I know I shouldn't have seen, but I was unsupervised sometimes. So, um, he was probably 10, 11, you know, mm-hmm. in an age where he, he understood it was, wasn't real and things like that. And there's other things I would not let him watch. You know, just, just, he's not, he's got to be older before he sees that. So, I had to be a better parent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it just comes up on the show a lot. I, I, I remember seeing horror movies since I was like uh, six. So. Mm-hmm. But. Well, yeah, I mean, well, see, we had, um, we had a neighbor who HBO had just come out and our neighbor subscribed to it, but it bled through our cable. So we got it for free. And my parents kept calling the cable company and said, look, we're getting this for free. We don't want to get billed for it, which made me mad because I was able to see, like, Kingdom <laughs> of the Spiders and, you know, Grizzly and all these movies that I never would have access to. So they'd come and they'd put a blocker on, and three days later it was back again. And this went on for weeks. And they finally said, guess what? You get HBO for free. We're not sending someone out there again to <laughs> deal with this. So, uh-huh. so, you know, I got to see all these really first-run movies that, that – um, you know, I was probably eight or nine that, that I never would have had, never would have had the luxury of seeing. And then one summer, and this is a mystery I've never been able to solve, but one summer we got a U- UHF channel and there was this horror host called Count Rigamortis. That was his name. He was like dressed in a cape and he sat in this director's chair in what was obviously a studio. Um, and you could show like, every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, like, you know, 20 million miles to earth, destroy all monsters, seventh voyage of Sinbad, the Raven, you know, I saw a hundred movies, sometimes twice. And then he was gone. And I've never in my life been able to figure out who this guy was, what this program was. It had to be illegal, but nonetheless, you know, I saw tons of movies. No one, no one I talked to even can remotely remember it. So, and it was not a figment of my imagination. <laughs> so maybe someday one of your guests will say, "Oh yeah, I know what that was." <laughs> I, I want to record. I don't know if you've seen it or not. I think the trailer just came out yesterday uh, for the new Gamera movie coming out. It looks no, pretty, yeah. I I didn't know they made another one. Yeah, it's a Japanese movie. It looks uh, it looks insane. Is it? Is it? Because the last one was Gamera the Brave, right? Yeah, this I think this one's just called Gamera. Gamera, I, you know, I like I've got a soft spot for Gamera. He he doesn't get the love Godzilla gets, but you know, he can fly. That's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he's fighting. How giant. he does it without burning his legs is another mystery. But <laughs> you know, how does Godzilla breathe radioactive fire without destroying his esophagus? Those are things we'll never know. Mm-hmm. And uh, back to uh, Queen Crab, it's out now, so people can uh, get it on DVD um, uh, over at uh, Wild Eye Releasing. I believe you can get it on Amazon. You can get it uh, where DVDs are sold. And uh, believe- yeah, so I would suspect it'll turn up in FYE. Uh, they could order it directly from Wild Eye, um, and it's sub distributors. I think if you go to Wild Eye, you could probably find a trail of places to buy it. Yeah, and uh, is it, was Queen Crab uh, based on a uh, true story? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> Crabs have plagued uh, the world for a long time, but uh, <laughs> it's uh, no, it's, it's it's hopefully all science fiction. Hmm. I, I enjoyed your performance in it as well. Yes. Yeah, I play the, the jerk dad. You know, it's funny. It's funny that, you know, that big line I had to say about the daughter says, what is, what did she say? What is uh, something or other? And I had this long, it's like I had to, ex- it was a paragraph. I said, Brett, I cannot memorize this. I'm sorry. I don't even, I can't even pronounce half the words. So we had to put. Like off camera, I'm looking in the microscope and I'm moving around and I had to figure out how to do it so I could see. I broke it into three different paragraphs so I could read it off the paper. <laughs> <laughs> because I could not remember. I, I said, I cannot memorize this. I mean, I just can't. It, I, it's just more than my brain could deal with at the time. So we had to put little cheat sheets everywhere for me to, uh, to get through it. So. You could have put them under the microscope. 
I could have, yeah. That would, that's a that's a good idea. I can't write that small though. <laughs> yeah, right. You just have to write it under the microscope first. Mm. Right, or put it on the back of an amoeba. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good idea. Well, we want to thank you for coming on tonight. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. Oh, thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Great. We'll look forward to more of your stuff and seeing some of your other stuff. Yeah, you. yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to come back anytime you need it. Great. Yeah. yeah. We'll be in touch then. Yeah. When you got All some right. new stuff thank coming out, let much. us know. Thank you very much. Yep. Absolutely. Hey, this is Dan Creed from Bastard. Co-director Patrick Robert Young. And co-director Paul Robinson. And you're listening to Without Your Head. <laughs>